J Spotlight presents its Roundtable series. In this program, Camden Schools and the Future of Urban Education in New Jersey. This program was recorded April 1st, 2013 at Rutgers University in Camden. This program is brought to you by the Cooper Foundation on the web at cooperhealth.org and by the New Jersey Education Association at njea.org and We Can Do Better for Kids on the web at wecandobetternewjersey.org. The panelists in this program are Gloria Bonilla Santiago, Overseer and Board Chair of the Leap Academy University Charter School in Camden. Sean Brown, a member of the Camden Board of Education. Karen Douglas Collins, a math teacher at Pine Point Middle School in Camden. Pam Garwood, Program Director for the New Jersey Education Association. Ryan Hill, Founder and Executive Director of Team Schools. George Norcross III, Chairman of the Cooper Health System. Monique Ragsdale, Camden Community and Parent Advocate. And Catherine Ribe, former member of the Camden Board of Education. The moderator for the program is John Mooney, education editor and co-founder of NJ Spotlight. Welcome, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for joining us tonight on, on what I'm sure is going to be a uh, provocative and, and interesting conversation. My name is John Mooney, uh, uh, founding editor of NJ Spotlight, and I'll be their host and moderator today uh, in discussing Camden Schools and, and, the, and what it says for the future of urban education in, in New Jersey. Um, for those who don't know us, uh, quickly, uh, NJ Spotlight is a three-year-old news and policy website um, launched you know, by a bunch of uh, print refugees like myself who, who got out of the newspaper business and focusing on public policy issues like education, healthcare, um, energy and environment, and, and public finance. And part of what we do, and, and we hope we'll visit the site, but part of what we do we think is very important is we hold discussions across the state around some of these issues that we cover. And, in, in, and they're called public roundtables. We've held about 15 of them so far. Uh, in, in, in different places, and, and this is the first time we're down here in Camden, and uh, very excited about it, and certainly want to thank our host, uh, Cam Rutgers Camden, for a wonderful space for doing this. And I know parking, you had to take a bus to, to get here, but uh, hopefully you're, most folks are here, and, and hopefully you can get comfortable and, and enjoy yourselves. And for this one, well, let's just say the timing was pretty good. Um, uh, I wish I could say that NJ Spotlight was so nimble that uh, Governor Christie announces something and a week later we're ready to hold a, a public forum around it. And, and, and it's okay if you think that's the case. Uh, but in all honesty, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Camden's certainly been a, a hotbed of activity around school reform and, and we wanted to come down here and we, we will say uh, we were pleased that Governor Christie saw this was happening and, and got his announcement in just in time. But I don't want to, obviously, I don't want to make too much you know, light of, of that. Uh, this, is, this is serious stuff. The stakes are high on everything we're going to be talking about today, uh, not the least of which for the generation of children who are now in the schools and the generations to come. Um, we hope to touch all of that uh, in, in some form or another. Cert certainly, we're going to talk about the state's takeover plans and what was announced last week, uh, but also the turnaround efforts that are already underway in the schools. Um, as well as the role of charter schools in, in the city, and then the coming role of Renaissance schools um, that will and how they will all affect uh, Camden's children. It's a lot to cover. We have a very large panel, um, admittedly, but we think it's worth it, and we think this is the time and place to have this conversation. Before we get to that, a few logistics. Uh, included in some materials that you uh, received, hopefully received, um, we gave you some bios of each of the panelists, short bios of them. We also gave you some postcards which has the, um, our, our site 
our site's URL, but also a way to join our, our daily and weekly digest. We hope you will do so and, be, and continue to follow the coverage. We hope also that you will share it. We tell everybody, just share it with one friend or colleague, and that doubles our audience, and it's a wonderful thing. So um, please do so. We also had made available some index cards. Um, so for folks, w really what's important in this is that there is some interaction between ourselves and the audience. And um, a good way to do it is we, we ask you folks to write questions or comments on index cards, at which time you can wave. And I'm going to introduce NJ Spotlight staff who are going to be uh, sort of floating around the outside. It's Kevin Harold, our publisher. I think I saw uh, Lee Keo, our managing editor. Tom Johnson, our, our energy and environment writer. Andrew Kitchenman, our healthcare writer. And I think that covers us. So Paula Saha, we'll get to Paula's role. Um, what is an event these days without a hashtag? And yes, we are going to be live, not only live streaming this event for folks to watch, but we'll also be having a Twitter conversation. And that hashtag, if you haven't noticed the signs all over the room, is Camden ED, Camden Ed. And please uh, feel free, but any of our audience on the live stream, feel free to, to tweet about this. Uh, certainly, even if you have questions, tweet them in. Uh, if we have enough conversation going, it's something we will publish tomorrow in our coverage of this event as well. Um, certainly, uh, not last but not least is is our sponsors, and and um, I want to stress that we don't we couldn't do this without support of sponsors. Uh, I'm not sure NJ Spotlight would exist without support of sponsors, and it's very important to us. And we are very thankful to have such a great group, and it it, it really means a lot. And they are the NJEA, the New Jersey Education Association, the Cooper Foundation, and We Can Do Better for Kids, the advocacy group, all with big stakes in this. Uh, discussion and, and again it's really with great appreciation that we that we have them on board um, the last ground rule is we really is it, it comes it's civility and brevity uh, the civility part is we really like these to be conversations they are not really meant to be debates to go back and forth and pro and con it's a chance to get some key people in the room to talk about these issues in a conversational way that comes the brevity piece. Uh, pretend, and I, was, I say this to the, the panelists as well, we're going to pretend we're sitting around a kitchen table of sorts and we're, com and we're having a conversation. It's, and when you sit around a kitchen table, you don't make little speeches to each other. You, you converse and you have some back, back and forth. And that's what we hope will come of this. So um, let's get going. And uh, let me introduce our panel. Um, we have, and I'll, I'll take it from, from the, uh, the chronology of the of the table. We have Mon Monique Rag Ragsdale, a community and parent advocate who I've gotten to know in, in Camden. Uh, she's a <laughs> applause. This is the one chance where you can applaud. Uh, she's a Camden organizer with Save Our Schools New Jersey, a grassroots organization advocating for public education statewide, and also a mother of an eighth grader boy, right, in, in Camden schools. Next to her is Catherine Rebay. Uh, she served on the board from May 2011 until last week. Uh, when some of you might know, she resigned following the announcement of the state's intervention plans. And she'll probably talk a little bit about that. <laughs> she is also very interesting, a high school chemistry uh, teacher, first in Camden schools and now in Collingswood. Next to, next to Catherine is Karen Douglas Collins. Uh, she is a math coach and leader in Pine Point Middle School. She has worked in Camden Public Schools since 1986 and been a teacher in elementary, middle, and adult education, and now is a math coach and leader at Pine Point. <laughs> Next to her is George Norcross, chairman of Cooper Health System. Uh, I think it needs no introduction. He's been a, a prominent voice in the, in the state and in Camden around some of the issues of education and where I've gotten to know him uh, in, in my new role. Served as trustee of Cooper Health and Cooper University Hospital in Camden since 1990. Now executive chairman of Connor Strong Buckaloo, the insurance and brokerage and consulting firm. And, and, and notably, he, his foundation's family foundation and also Cooper Foundation is working in partnership on the Renaissance Schools, which we will be discussing today as well. Um, we, yep, please. Next to George is Ryan Hill, founder and executive director of Team Schools, somebody I've gotten to know out of Newark, actually. He founded the first team academy in Newark, starting a network that's since grown to five schools, the largest network in the, in the state of charter schools, and of course is teaming up uh, with the other foundations to open the five Renaissance schools in Camden. Uh, 
next is Pam Garwood, Program Director at NJEA, uh, coordinator of the NJEA's Priority School Support uh, Initiative, which is helping schools do the turnaround efforts and, and working inside the schools and with the district. Before that, she was an elementary school teacher and facilitator in Bridgeton. And in my Googling, I discovered I think you were the Teacher of the Year at some, at some point out of Bridgeton. So congratulations. <laughs> And then a, 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 another person who probably needs no introduction in the, city, in the city, Gloria Bonilla Santiago of Leap Academy University Charter School. I've known uh, uh, Gloria since I think 1997, was that when Leap opened? At one of the first charter schools in the state. Uh, she is of course also a professor of public policy at Rutgers Camden and director of its community leadership center. And our last, uh, yep. And, the, and the, the last person at the table is not Patricia Kenny, an assistant superintendent who uh, hopefully will still be attending but is, is running late. And we've asked Sean Brown, a member of the school board, uh, to, to join us and, and be part of the conversation. I had hoped to call on him from the audience anyway, so I figured uh, until uh, Pat can join us, Sean will, will be there. So, um, yep. Let me start with the ta state takeover. It's the issue, it's the big issue in the room right now, obviously, and in this city. And I'm going to be fairly open-ended on this, and I, and I wanted to, to start with those who are most affected by it. And, and I warned Karen uh, Douglas Collins that she'd probably be the first, first person I'd call on. But what was your, as a teacher, uh, and, and somebody who's been in the district as long as you have, what was your reaction last week when you heard the news of, of the state? Uh, at least proposing to, to come in and take control of the district? Well, first, I would, I would like to begin with asking, what does it really look like, you know, as a, as a teacher in Camden City? You know, there, uh, we know, uh, and uh, along with myself, that the state has been in Camden City for some time. But also, we will have the same students, it will be the same communities, same environment. So what exactly does that mean, you know, with the state takeover? Thank you. Let me jump to Sean. I, you, you didn't even know you were going to be on the panel before you showed up, but we're going to go to you right away. Uh, you're a member of the school board that is going to have to act on this um, and, and decide whether to, to appeal or not. Uh, there's been some indication that the, the school board is, is on board. Certainly some of its members, some of its leaders stood up there with Governor Christie last week uh, in announcing this and, and all indications from, I, I went to the first board meeting afterwards, all indications there was still some support for it. Tell me your, your reaction when this, this came down and, and, and where do you predict it's going in terms of the school board's uh, you know, position on it? So first, uh, good evening to everybody. I know I have to see a lot of friends um, and people that I know out in the audience and to everyone else, it's, it's nice to see you. So to answer the second question first, my reaction, um, so two, I guess two Sundays ago, uh, our, our board president confirmed what had been a rumor for a week before that and said that the governor was coming to announce uh, the takeover the next day. Um, and my reaction was surprise because of the timing, but not necessarily because of uh, the, 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 the action itself. Um, there's a lot that's going on. M m most of which probably hasn't made the newspaper. There's lots that's going on in the Camden School District in the last few years since, since I've been on the school board. Um, there is a process known as CUSAC uh, where every school district in New Jersey has to go through it, but it's almost like an audit of a lot of the departments and things. And Camden went through the process like every other school district and gets a score, and a lot of the scores are really, really, really low. And just based on those scores alone, it, it, the school district could have been taken over uh, when they first came out. The district had an opportunity to provide a response to that saying this is what we're going to do to fix these things um, and when we look at the actual takeover information on paper you see that it's cited that the response of the school district which was approved by the school board that I sit on that the response wasn't where it should have where it should have been. So on one hand surprised at the timing or was it yeah, in I, your I, view somewhat inevitable that this was Yes, I would say it is inevitable. And the only surprise in timing is that, um, and it's, it's no surprise to anybody, is that we were, um, you know, I, I get a call about 28 hours before we're interviewing finals to be our next superintendent. Um, I think a lot of people had put a lot of hope into that process and that a new superintendent would be able to transform the school district and, and, the, and the people, um, and it was a really, it was a fair and proper process and the candidates that we had 
got there the right way without the influence of politics or outsiders. I think we're all very happy about that. We're happy with the quality of the, the finalists that we had. Um, so there, 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 was, there was surprise for that reason. Let me ask another, at that point, another uh, school board member. Uh, not anymore. Um, you, you, made, you made a little noise in, in announcing that day that you were going to uh, resign, I guess uh, fair to say, in protest. Um, you know, tell us a little bit. This is, I think, the first time you've spoken publicly since all that came down. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But you know, tell us a little bit about your thinking um, as it came down. Mostly, um, I think sort of my first reaction is just really sad. This is something, you know, and we, we can do this, we can sit here in a room and we can talk about the ideas and the processes behind it. Um, but at the end of the day, these are kids and these are teachers. Um, and there's really high stakes here. And it made me really sad because I think this is not the way to fix this problem. I think this is kind of an easy and showy way to address what's going on, which yeah, like Sean said, there are a lot of problems. I don't think there's anyone who can look and say, well, there's no problem here. I don't know why people are getting involved. Everything's just fine. Clearly, there are real problems. Um, but I don't think this is the way to address it. I think this is politics getting involved in education. And I think that to make real effective change in education, we need to let educators lead that. Let me ask um, some of those some of those outside the school school system uh, who have been obviously following you closely and um, George Norcross and obviously this has been a almost a, a crusade for you in terms of improving uh, you know the state of education for Camden children and, and you and I have talked quite a few times about it. Give me your when when this was coming down. You may have known it was coming, um, but uh, give me your sense of of. Uh, of your thinking when this was announced or, or you became aware of it and and whether you know your, your initial reaction to it as, as a step to, to help the schools or not thank you as long as I can remember some 40 years at least the residents of this city and the public have been in broad discussions about the failures of the public schools in the city of Camden and throughout the region and throughout our state in 40 years I would say things changed for the good. The families of this city have continued to suffer and suffer endlessly. I don't blame the teachers. Obviously the families and students are not to blame. I blame the administration. I blame the leadership. Some of the members of the recent leadership accepted and condoned a no-show superintendent in the last three to five years. I don't recall hearing that kind of outrage when the superintendent was AWOL. I think what the governor did was the right thing. Is it a be all, end all answer to changing the public schools and giving the families of this city what they deserve? Of course not. Takeovers in this state, in Newark, Jersey City, Patterson, have lacked critical elements in order to ensure success. There's been a lack of parental engagement, a lack of engagement with the NJEA, which is obviously a critical part, a lack of engagement directly with teachers, community leaders, and religious leaders. I say enough is enough. What's going on has failed. It's time to start over, look towards other alternatives, other ideas, think outside the box. Because what's been going on hasn't worked. And each year another class is being sentenced somewhere they don't belong. Thank you. Let me, uh, Gloria, um, speak to it a little bit. You've somewhat been on the outside, but you're obviously very connected to Camden, uh, the city, and his children. What was your reaction to, to what, what the governor announced last week? Um, so, so thank you so much for inviting me to, to this wonderful panel. And uh, I look for the opportunities whenever we can to, to help children. And as you know, I spent 20 years of my career um, building LEAP and being on the floor. So I know the, the pain of what it is that it takes to, to do this work. And I feel the pain of the teachers and uh, of the kids and the parents whenever we don't succeed. So, how I saw the news, um, like George said, is, is an opportunity for, for coming together to how do we fix it? See, I want to move forward. I want to be part of the group that says 
we have some things that have worked for us that we could share that we want to work together with the district uh, the most important thing here is the kids not the adults I think that we, we, we spent an incredible amount of time discussing about you know uh, what went wrong I, I think that this discussion tonight has to be about how do we come together as a group of leaders here in the city because we have the anchor institutions we have the charter schools we have the renaissance schools now we have wonderful principles and i've got to tell you very seldom do i advocate for the educational leadership program that we run at Rutgers, but we we have trained a cadre of principals to send them back to the district and not one of them was given an opportunity to become a principal i welcome this opportunity now for those principals and i see some of them in the audience and i actually sent a list today of those principles to the to the leadership in the state of people that i know are great uh, principals in the district that haven't had opportunity to lead so it seems to me that this is an opportunity that's how i see it to to come together to work as a unit to really save the children because this is all about the kids if it's not then we are in the wrong business why do you think i mean and i'm going to follow up with each of you on this but why is it different under the state um, and and I'm, I'll, I'll bring in even Ryan Hill on this, uh, and it's I know I'm not asking you to speak for the state. And somebody, our first first question of of the night is why is the state not here? Um, I invited them, I swear, um, and I invited them repeatedly, and they um, they have sat on other panels for us. Uh, we've done a bunch on on charter schools and and teacher quality and and graduation requirements, and and this one they. Uh, conspicuously said uh, no thanks thanks but no thanks I think now we know why um, because of the timing of their announcement I then made the offer afterwards and and they still uh, would rather sit it out so hopefully we'll come back here and, and have a conversation with some state folks about it as well there may be some state folks in the room um, as well hopefully we'll be taking this conversation back but let me ask uh, Ryan Hill, you're in Newark and you, you obviously don't speak for the state, but you've been in a district that is state run um, and you have a sense of it. Newark is you know, 15 years plus at this point, um, has had three different uh, superintendents, you know, five, I guess, five different governors uh, playing one role or another. And I think one of the important things about state takeover is it's not one thing. There's, you know, the administrations change, superintendents change and the like. But you know, speak from your you know community perspective in in Newark um, to to what impact it does have, uh, and and you know tell the tell the folks a little bit about how Newark has has fared through this, and 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 maybe if there's any lessons for Camden. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think um, what we've heard up here about it so far is kind of on the money in the sense that it the mere act of uh, the state taking over isn't going to be a magic wand, silver bullet solution to whatever uh, whatever is going on in Camden right now. Uh, in Newark, we've seen a lot of stuff as a result of state takeover that's both good and bad. Uh, Mr. Norcross mentioned some of the things that didn't work so well, and I would say the the absolute key to making it work is having the right superintendent in place. So whoever the state chooses as that superintendent is going to be key. Just speaking from the charter sector, the superintendent in Newark doesn't affect us directly so much, but what we have seen over the years is for a long time we had superintendents who were um, either neutral or hostile to charter schools, and that mentality sort of trickled down throughout the district. And one of the issues we have, we have hundreds and hundreds of visitors, and some years as high as a thousand visitors within a single year to our schools and we've had more visitors from South Africa from London from Germany than we've had from Newark public schools and that was because there was an us and them uh, sort of divide mentality uh, that did trickle down from the top or at least wasn't uh, actively fought from the top now that we have a superintendent a state appointed superintendent who is who sees the whole city as part of her purview who sees <coughs> education for kids in newark regardless of what kind of school they're in as part of what she's concerned with the dynamics a lot different and so it's way too early to say what the results of that will be but what's glaringly obvious to us is what we all know in education is that the leader matters and the leader of the uh, newark public schools that position matters a lot and 
whomever they choose to be superintendent of Camden City Schools is going to matter a whole lot as well. Monique, I don't want you to think I forgot you. Um, listen, you're listening to this, and you've you've you know you followed the uh, the board closely, and I think you and I spoke in the past about you know there was a somewhat of an ultimatum letter in back in August that the that the state issued, and and clearly had some language that they were uh, inclined to go this way if 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 things didn't go as planned. Uh, was there some sense of ine inevitability for you uh, that you'd be in this place? Give us you know your reaction. Um, my reaction when I first heard it, um, I was kind of like um, shocked, but not really because, um, and my whole reaction to the state takeover for the school is not really, um, it's not a overly well, I don't see any promise in it, and mainly because the state was here before. We had um, appointed board for the last three years. Everyone's talking, oh, maybe this is promise, a new superintendent. Our problems are in a classroom. I want to hear from the teachers. I want to hear from the students. I want to hear from the people what is the problems that we are facing. And that's what we should be dealing with. When you deal with reform, you have to deal with what's going on inside the, the classroom. And as an apparent, I'm just seeing how everything goes wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm it's great that we have a panel. We all can discuss this. But truthfully, I think that everybody's going about it the wrong way. Um, reform is reform. We can't just section off, okay, we're gonna do this for this little side or do this for this little side. I see kids as whole, I see all the city kids. And I feel as though we should come together and we should be fighting to help all our kids and find out why don't they have materials? I mean, this is something that I know. Why don't they didn't have materials when the state was here before? They don't have materials now, you know? This is upsetting to me. This is supposed to be about education. You're supposed to be teaching children. I don't feel as though, you know, you give someone you know, testing units, even the, the RAC centers. Um, the RAC centers, there was a big hope that when they came in, before the state These are the over, regional achievement centers, the state's sort of new entity that, that is basically in the Camden right, schools. Right, they're in our point. schools yeah. now, and they're supposed to be, you know, assisting the teachers with instructions and everything. And I tell you, when I went and I surveyed, because I do, I want to see what my child is learning. And when I surveyed what they was doing, they were testing our children every six weeks. And I'm asking them, where's the materials for our children to go against us? And I'm telling you, it hurts me to see, because even as a student in college or anywhere, how can you learn without the resources? But this is a district that is spent, you know, by the math, and, and um, you know, math is done differently by different folks, but this is this spending $24,000 a kid. Um, some people have put that number even higher. I mean, there's, there's money in this district, and you guys are both on the, you know, you were on the school board, and Sean was as well, and, and you, you know, you, you had a say in that budget. Where's that money going if we have, and I can ask Karen on this too, if the resources aren't necessarily in the classroom. I mean, Catherine, do you want to speak to it? And I think one of the things that absolutely blew me away the first year that I was on the board, the first time I went through the Thanks budget, oh, the first time I went through the budgeting process is seeing, you know, so we looked at the previous year's budget, what had actually been spent of what was allotted the previous year's budget, and then predictions for the next year's budget. And I'm looking at the budget, and again, I started as a classroom teacher in Camden. I'm, I've been there where I'm begging That's right. for I'm supplies. Sorry. You started there. Um, and I'm looking at how much money is set, set aside for supplies and how much was actually being spent. And there was a glaring difference between money that was allocated and money that was actually being spent. And I think that has been a consistent big issue making sure that money is being spent where it matters and that's in the classrooms where things are needed. But isn't that an argument for change in management to make sure that the money's well, going to... Remember all of our budgeting and all of our financial everything that we do has been overseen and signed off on by a state monitor for mm -hmm. quite a few years mm -hmm. and that in particular. Sean, Sean, you're still on the you're still on the board. I mean, it, you know, I think we're there is a, seems to be a consensus here that, that the, the district hasn't worked as well as it as it could. Um, the board has a role in this, and you know, uh, and certainly, you know, I guess the point of this, the at least the state taking over, and you'll be under the under the takeover, they would become an advisory board, um, and I think at least under the law, there would be three additional members appointed by the state. Um, but speak to, you know, you're representing the district. You're the one, one person still in management um, somewhat. Uh, speak to that. It, I mean, obviously there's some issues of, of resources not reaching the kids. 
Okay, there's a lot there. So uh, first, my term is up on May 15th, and after the last board meeting, when I said to the mayor, I'm sure that's will be the, my last day on the board. Um, but when the bigger picture of resources, no one can argue with the student expenditure that you have in Camden uh, and, the, and the, the results that you get in education that the money's not being spent properly. So let me tell you a little story. Um, for those that may know me, you know sometimes I'm a bad boy and go do my own thing. So one day, um, I'm in the, cent the central office, which is right around the street from here, and um, the warehouse is connected. That's a matter of fact, that's what that long section is if you look at the building from the outside. So I go down there, and there are psh, at least 100 boxes of smart boards. And this was the third week of August uh, in 2011, third week of August in 2011. And that matters, and I'll tell you why in a second. So I'm, I'm there, and I see all these smart boards, and I, take a, I have my phone, and I take a picture of the smart boards on my phone um, and send the picture to the, my fellow board members and to the superintendent, who was Dr. Young at the time. The message that I got back was that security and maintenance should not have let me in the warehouse. <laughs> Um, I, I was asked, you know, they were talking about, you know, where board members should be and not be, and are people going to escort people? And at a certain point, somebody had to say, I kind of think the issue is that there are a bunch of smart boards and boxes in the warehouse, and it's two weeks before school starts. So that happens. A week later, that was a Monday. I'll go back the next Monday after the hoopla. I don't, I don't really care about who does like it. I go back there again. So now everybody knows that Sean Brown was in the warehouse. Guess what was still in there? The boxes and boxes of smart boards. We pay, this district has spent money for every um, freshman at the magnet schools, which is, would be about 200 students to have a, a laptop. You go to the magnet school, and I see a teacher here from there. Do you think all the students there have laptops that they use? They don't. We pay money for every administrator in the district to have iPads. I sit in, I've sat in a board meeting and heard people um, playing Angry Birds. And when I said that at a board meeting, they, they, didn't use the, uh, they didn't use it anymore. So, so as a board member, we, get, we ask for justification of, you want me to vote yes to this? Why do you want me to vote yes? So we, we need all of our administrators to have iPads so that they can, so that they can um, uh, evaluate teachers easier. And so I go to, school, I go to, I go to the schools, and I, I, I meet the principal, I say, hey principal, How's your iPad going? How's the thing going evaluating teachers? Like, and the response either, I don't have an iPad, and if I do, I certainly, no one ever talked to me about evaluating teachers with it. And then you get back to the, you know, you get back to the board meeting, and, I, and, you know, and I bring it up, and it's, and it's you no, know, you, you shouldn't, we're, we're not supposed to talk about these things. So there is a, there, there's clearly, there's a, a, a waste of money, clearly it's a leadership issue, and I just, want, I just want, if I may, just respond to something that was said earlier about that the state has been here. The state has been here, and the state has been, um, very effective in certain ways, and it's been very ineffective how so? in certain how, ways. Uh, how so? So, so how's it? Okay. So how's it been um, effective? Um, and I'm not saying this is a big deal. It's been effective in that you have had, um, you know, you've had clean, you've had clean audits in certain ways. You've had a level, a level of accountability where uh, either large purchases haven't been, haven't been made, or there's been monitoring of certain things that most could argue would be bad if they happened, that they didn't happen because it was stopped at the state level. It's also been bad in a few ways. I know uh, Ms. Ragsdale mentioned the, the regional achievement centers, which are in, which are in every school. You know, and I said this last week at the board meeting, um, there's a lack of communication between these groups that are in every single school that get to tell teachers and principals what to do, yet there's no evidence that they have a daily communication with the teachers and principals that are actually in those schools. So they have, they have oversight powers and are able to say what to do because the schools aren't performing well, but there's no evidence that they actually talk to the people that work in, that work in the schools. Now, you know, as a board member, I'm lied to all the time because um, people tell me what they think I want to hear. So we hear all the time about how great these things work, but then the evidence uh, shows, that, the sh shows, that, shows that they don't work. And, and I have to give, because I see a, a few board members in the room, you know, these, these and I'm real honest, you know, uh, most of the board members vote yes on these budgets. Kath Catherine voted, Catherine voted no on the first budget. We all voted yes on the last one because it was the best, and it was created the best of all of them. But a lot of times, you know, you know and, and this goes, as we participate here in a democracy, you have to count on the people that get to vote, to vote their conscience and both, vote based on facts. And that's one of the things that has gotten us in this position. Yeah, and, and somebody, I don't want, um, somebody mentioned 
uh, is Mr. Brown spe speaking for the board? He is not speaking for the board, I, and I just want to make it clear. He's you know, a member of the board that we invited up here, um, and obviously there's a lot of different opinions on, on this issue, and I just I wanted to be clear on that. Um, one of the big things that the, the state takeover is uh, going to bring fairly quickly, um, if it all goes through, is the appointment of a new superintendent and a, and a uh, you know, and, and a management structure that is going to have a role in the next teacher contract, um, which is expiring in, at the end of this year. I think the principal's contract has already expired. And I don't want to put her on the spot as speaking for, you know, the, the local union, but I did, I, I warned her a little bit that I, I might ask. Um, you know, the state takeover issue, there's, there are a couple, NJA represents the districts or the, or the locals in, in Jersey City and in Patterson, not in Newark. Um, you know, what does this mean to, to NJEA from that perspective? Is, is this, does it change the, the playing field for you guys? You know, speak a little bit from the, the, the contract negotiation piece. Yes, oh, I'm sorry, this is Pam Carwood, yes. I really want to talk about the state takeover, not the, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, this is a collective bargaining district and they were collective bargaining. The NJA field rep, the union president had personal issues. Uh, tonight so they're not here so I do not want to even presume to speak on their behalf but they are dedicated to this district they will do whatever they need to do to make sure the kids and students and teachers and ESP have what they need and they will support the board and whatever they can do to have a comprehensive clean collective bargaining process are you hopeful of, of that process I mean, I'm this does not after the last when it took them two years you worked without a contract I think before they settled yes yeah, so it's, it's going to be interesting it'll be interesting I've had a couple questions and and um, and this is for George Norcross um, not not disconnected from you know as a Democratic leader you, you in this in this county um, You've been in this, you know. You've been following this district for a long time. You know where? Why can't some of these things have happened within the current structure? Um, you know some of these players. You know why does it need the state to step in for for some of the things that you've, you know, I think rightfully signaled as, as problems in the district to be corrected within with with the local district as opposed to having a state role. Well, the answer to that is simple. It's uh, leadership. And every one of the members of this panel have said in one way or another the same thing. Leadership matters. Leadership matters of a business, an organization, a labor union, and any kind of community organization. Leadership matters. And we can go on with example after example of where that leadership has failed and failed miserably. And I think one of the members here said it correctly. This should be about looking forward, not looking backwards, because backwards will just occupy everybody's time in a useless uh, example and discussion of what's failed instead of thinking about and working together to find out what can work. That's the dilemma. And the dilemma also mandates the engagement of all the various constituent groups. That's the difference this time versus what I sense happened in Newark happened in Jersey City and happened in Patterson. You have a different series of circumstances that have taken place here. I'd like you to think for one moment and pause and consider if the Cherry Hill Public Schools were in this condition, what do you think would happen? The superintendent would have been fired. The business administrator would have been fired. All of management would have been fired. What's going on here is a state execution of a change that needs to be affected. Now, there's no proposition where the state can mandate or dictate and cure all the evils of what's gone on here. Because everyone in this room knows that poverty has a lot to do with what is going on in this school district. You could send every child from the Camden School District to Cherry Hill or the best parochial schools or Haddonfield or otherwise improvement would happen the question is would it be an overnight answer and the answer is obviously no the economic circumstances and social atmosphere in this city are such that change is needed and i don't think anybody up here can say what that change effectively is but it does start with leadership 
It starts with those that are committed to a cause that may differ in terms of opinions about how to get from point A to point Z. But specifically, what do I think is different this time? You have a governor that's committed. I'm not sure past governors who have taken over school districts have shown a commitment that this administration has shown to this city, whether it be in public safety, whether it be in funding to this city, whether it be coming to this city and taking along with the leadership in the Democratic legislature on a bipartisan basis a way to make things better and different. At least they're trying. There are too many people that want to talk about the past and what can't work and talk about failures. We need to talk about what can happen and reason together to make it successful. Pam, yeah, do you want to add something? And um, I've had the pleasure to meet George and have some conversation with George about Camden City. But I do want to talk about the state being in Camden, the state takeover, because I'm working very intimately with the new state initiative in Camden City. Yes, the state has been in Camden City for 20 years, taking over the financial part of Camden City. They have been ra ranked with CUSAC, which was mentioned earlier, and they got a low C. Um, they came up with the best. Than, I think it was lower than that. Maybe, well, okay. maybe, yeah. I, get, maybe I was a high, you know, I, I graded on a curve. Um, the other thing is, is that last year, the Department of Education created the most innovative plan to support urban education, which has been my career for the last 35 years. And I also want to, want to let you know I am a quasi-Camden. My father was born and raised in Camden, and my father-in-law graduated from Woodrow Wilson High School, and my mother-in-law worked at Lady of Lords. So I want to see the Camden I remember when I was coming to Camden with my family. Um, they created the Regional Achievement Centers. 24 of Camden schools are working intimately with the New Jersey Department of Education, RAC. It is supposed to be the best thing that's gonna to happen to urban education in New Jersey. It is, they are so committed to it that outside entities are funding it with private funds. Now the Camden RAC, I think you've, they, Camden City's been blessed but I think a pretty very innovative RAC director and some RAC people that are working. At this time, they are building a comprehensive K-12 literacy program where Rowan, Rutgers, NJEA, the CEA, the coaches, the supervisors, the teachers are working. They are building something consistent that has never really happened before. They are helping teachers from the top down, where NJA is helping with the bottom up, to embrace the new core common state standards. Why, when so much money and so much fanfare has been given to these seven regional achievement centers throughout the state, wouldn't they let them even finish a year or two of this innovative work before the state came in to take over? So I just, the state is here. Yeah, and let me follow up with George on your point, and somebody asked this, what is a, you know, you, you speak about a lack of leadership. What are the, what are the qualities of leadership you think that this district needs um, that, would, that would make the difference? Um, you know, what, what kind of leadership is, is missing from your perspective? I'm just following up on your point. I think you need a strong leader. I think having a leader that can make decisions individually but has a common interest in, as I said, gathering the various constituencies and sitting down and working together. You cannot have an adversarial relationship with the NJA who represents the teachers. You need the teachers to be part of the solution, not part of a continuing engagement of problems. You have to get parents engaged. You have to get religious leaders engaged. You have to reach out to the entire community but you need a leader who's prepared to make hard decisions, who's prepared to lead, and not act as the state has acted as long as they've been in the district. As long as they've been in this district, they've been a veto mechanism, not an initiative, not leaders in my opinion. And that's what the state monitor is. State monitor is able to veto actions. They're not the ones responsible for not getting out uh, school supplies, as Sean talked about. 
They may be the ones that block spending, but they're not the ones that prevented that. And I'm sure everyone in this room has examples of failures that have occurred. But each of you in your employment, in your communities, in your lives all recognize leadership matters. And if it's not working, it needs to be changed. And you do have an administration and leaders in the legislature that are demanding an affecting change and prepared to put their money where their mouth is. Catherine, you wanted to follow up on that? I think that yes, I would agree that leadership matters. I think we very much disagree on what leadership means in education. Um, I think we tend to look at it, there's very much a trend right now to look at education through a business model um, and say, okay, leadership at the top, how is that gonna go down? Ultimately, what we need are leaders within the classrooms and within the buildings. And we can stand up here yes. and we can talk about the qualities of a superintendent. And yes, it matters. It matters a lot. But at the end of the day, we need to be building the capacity within our teaching staff so that they can become leaders in their departments, leaders in their schools, because at the end of the day, that's, I mean, that's where education happens. It's in the classroom. And my concern is, these initiatives, they just, they don't see that. And sometimes I feel as an educator that I'm just like yelling this over and over and nobody who's making these decisions will hear it. Mm -hmm. But you wanna make change in education, <clears throat> it's gotta start with the teachers. Let me, and I do wanna move on to s sort of talking about what, what are some turnaround strategies happening in the schools. But I, I'll go back to Sean as, as the one member on, on the board uh, who's still here. Uh, I know you can't, you don't speak for the board, but any predictions on how the board is going to act? I think there's a 20-day time limit um, on this uh, for for the board to either acquiesce or, or move on or, or to appeal, I'm sorry. Um, do you want to speak to, to what happens next? Sure. So I, I would start with me, and I saw Matt Katz here earlier. I was sitting at the press conference uh, last Monday and reading tweets, and I saw from um, one of the reporters, I'm not sure if it was Matt or, or Phil, or one of the reporters reported that some of the board members that I sat on the board with had, were officially in support of the takeover. And I was shocked to see this because I found out about it the Sunday before, the day before, you know, no, no one ever asked my opinion. So somehow a third of our board is voicing its support for a takeover when the details weren't released yet, um, which means that somehow um, politics co-opted the process, which in part um, is why, you know, Catherine, um, you know, quit obviously because of the, that co-option of politics. My, so, so here we are um, the following day talking to the Commission of Education and the mayor um, who, who, where the mayor who's appointed all of us is obviously in strong support of the takeover. So the law says that we have to, it's, it's, it's a term, um, uh, uh, order to show cause is the legal term. We have to, we have to sh write to a judge and say, judge, don't approve to this takeover because um, of X, Y, Z, and we have to list those things out. At least that's the process. So, where we are right now, and, and Ray, I'm, I'm being, I'm being real careful. Where we are right now is, by April 15th, there will be a response to it, and my prediction is, um, what, 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 and I know I put it on Facebook, and maybe a few people saw it the eight page or nine page document of what the takeover actually looks like mm -hmm. compared to 11 pages, okay. The 11 page document what the takeover uh, looks like um, and what actually happens, I do think there will be some room for negotiation in that. But I think that overall people have accepted that this is inevitable, the term that you've used and it will happen. And if you don't mind, let me, if I could, let me just share what some of those things are in terms of takeover because when people say that the state's already been here, the, take, the provisions in the takeover are very different than what we've seen. So one thing, and this would make some people on the panel happy is that the superintendent, the two superintendents, the director of human resources, and the business administrator will have to resign. Uh, next, um, the board obviously won't have any voting rights. It will become an advisory board. And whether it's nine or 12 is, is up to the commissioner. That's not in place yet. Uh, third, um, um, all professional services contracts that are currently in place could be uh, automatically terminated by the by the by the new superintendent and that's that's everywhere from food service to attorneys to 
all sorts of contracts that are in place will be in the hands of um, the commissioner and the, and the new superintendent. And then obviously the, the superintendent would report directly to the commissioner and not have a, a board to talk on. So the board would be advisory, which means the board would still meet on a monthly basis and still talk about stuff from the representatives of the community, but the superintendent would need the board's um, final approval for things to, to go through, meaning that the superintendent would be a, a super powerful person in, um, in, 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 in the district. So our, our, board, our board's place, the, the current board education, the current eight members now that are on there, um, we, have to, we have to get this response. And again, my, my prediction is that there'll be in a negotiation and there, there won't be a, 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 a major shift from what the state proposed when it, um, in its takeover documents. Somebody asked, Don't, won't you feel disenfranchised? Won't the community be disenfranchised by? I mean, you're, you're a board member, and Monique, I want to So this, 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 is, this is, this is, this is, a, this, that's a very good question. There's, this is pretty complicated. So in the mid-2000s, um, through the Mira legislation, the Municipal Recovery Economic uh, Revitalization Act that, that was passed, uh, the way the Board of Education was designed was three people were appointed by the mayor, three people were appointed by the governor, three people were, were elected. When, the, um, when Corazon's last day office, he signs the, the new version of Mira, one of the things that happens is our school district goes to a type one district, and, and you know, and this was intentional, obviously, by the pol by the politics. Uh, uh, it was designed so that the mayor, who they already knew the day the governor signed that would be Dana Red, would appoint all the school board members. And, for, and and obviously, I'm one one of the people that was lucky enough to get there. So, the disenf if if it's di if if disenfranchisement means the voters don't have a say who's on the school board, then you could argue that that was already in place. Um, you could also argue that the voters elected Dana Red mayor. Over, overwhelmingly, I mean, she had over over 85 uh, percent of the of the of the of the voters. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, wasn't that much okay? But she but she she obviously she she she, she was she was elected. The, the, but and then there's one other point though, and I and I see you know Monique is on here, and I see a couple people in the audience, uh, you know Keith and Garrett. People, if people come to a school board meeting, and I and I get to say this because I'm pretty strong on this. If people come to a school board meeting and complain about something. Something will happen to fix it. If people just show up and speak out about an issue that's legitimate, something will happen to fix it. Something will happen to fix it. And to, the, to those out there in the audience, you know, I encourage you to encourage, especially parents, to continue that process, whether it's an advisory board, a superintendent, no matter what happens, um, things will happen if, if, if people are speaking out against it. P people in Canada for too long have felt more than disenfranchised. They felt that even their elected officials, which could be their mayor, city council, don't really listen to them. Yet the same people get keep getting elected. So when we talk about, you know, earlier, um, Mr. Norcross is talking about leadership matters. Well, leadership matters, including the people that are selected in the Democratic Party and the structure. That matters too. Monique, do you want to? Add? Yes. Um. Just a, a little inside when you say this franchise. Yes, I do see that. I think this should be the opportunity where Camden should actually get their elected board back. I mean, we need to have some voice, some transparency. I'm a parent, I go to the board meeting, and he's talking about people don't show up. I feel like I'm talking to the walls half of the time. And it's not, I don't just, I go for everything for all the kids, the curriculum, and it's, it's kind of hard because I don't know if anyone ever been to a board meeting, but it's disorganized, it's frustrating, you're, you're feeling like you're pouring out your heart, and you feel like a disempowered parent when you cannot have no type of input or anything, transparency with the whole board. So I guess, when I see the state takeover, I feel as though, okay, now, once again, the residents are getting stampeded on, and now, you know, we're not going to be able to have a vote on who should represent us, or we're not going to have any, and like Ribeye say, I mean, I'm still listening to everybody talk, and I agree, reform starts in the classroom. Um, we can have a leader, yes, that leader can help them get the materials, the supplies, execute why the text where all the equipment was in the warehouse or something like that. I mean, yes, those are leadership issues, but as far as reform, that's in the classroom. Let, or let's move to the classroom. And, and Karen, I want to ask you, you've, you're in a district or you're in a school that is a priority school, and, and the terminology being the state has, has you know, under, um, basically under federal policy, there are new labels for every school uh, out there uh, or, or schools that are, are subpar and there's priority schools which are the very lowest performing schools in the state. Uh, there's focus schools that have wide achievement gaps, specific ones, uh, within the, you know, between different uh, subgroups of students and then there's a, the other end is reward schools which are the very highest achieving in the state. Um, Karen works in, in, um, in a school that is a priority school and, and you know, tell me 
Yeah, and there have, and you have started to see some of the work coming out of the the racks, the regional achievement centers, the state. You know, tell me what some of those steps are, and and are they making a difference? I, I want to follow up with a question that somebody who's a very good one. Um, you know, what are the one or two things? I think they asked for three, but time is of the essence. What are one or two things that you think would improve on the schools? But talk a little bit about what's happening now, and and then we can uh, you know go around the room a little bit. Okay, with the priority schools in the in the building. It is a plus, okay? We have someone coming into, into the building, actually going into the classrooms, taking a look without uh, making teachers feel uncomfortable. You know, we normally have principals, we have supervisors in the past that would come into the classroom. Having someone outside of the district coming in and saying to teachers, this is what is needed, uh, why don't you work with this? Why don't you do better with your, uh, whether it's centers, whether you're, uh, you need to work a little bit better with classroom management. It is a plus with priority schools in the building. We have actually have had teachers ask, you know, the individual, can you assist? Because, you know, we have many teachers in, they do need additional assistance when it comes to uh, different issues that are going on in the classroom. We have, we have uh, teachers that may be coming from an elementary level, going to the middle school, which is different. We have high school teachers coming down, coming into the uh, middle schools, which is a different category for them in the classroom. So it is, it is a plus with the priority schools coming into the classroom. It's teachers are feeling comfortable. They're feeling that they can ask for help. You know, this is something that may, maybe they can prepare to get better at when uh, there is a, a administrator coming in where they can make some improvements. So I have heard nothing but and have seen nothing but positive things coming out uh, with priority schools within the building. Does that move achievement levels? Do those things you're talking about? I mean, at least it, it, from the right now, we're looking at all the data, you know, looking at the, uh, the tests that are coming in, and we have seen some improvement. It may not be what you see, what you think at a, uh, at a looking at it all together, but there is improvement. Teachers are overwhelmed, you know, with what's going on in the classrooms. You know, when you have, when you're teaching in the classroom and things have changed from down to changing the way that you're writing the lesson plans, changing into moving, instead of teaching as a whole group instruction, you're now breaking it down to the interventions and the strategies to attack, you know, some individual sh uh, strategies with, with students in a classroom. So uh, not just the lesson planning, uh, also with the data, having teachers look at the data, using that information to improve their instruction. There's a lot, you know, that's going on, but they still feel a little bit more comfortable with someone else that is not within the building, not looked at as an administrator coming in just to evaluate. Pam, hey, talk a little bit. You've worked closely with the RACs and, and your own initiative. Yeah, the um, governor has designated the lowest 5% of schools priority schools, but the NJEA, through work with uh, many of the schools that need improvement in the state, have decided over a year ago to create the NJA Priority Schools Initiative. And we have 12 schools throughout the state, two are in Camden, and we have three more we're uh, hopefully working in next year, that we have gone in and we have supplied them with professional development based on the needs of their teachers from the lack of follow through with all the professional development they've had throughout the years. We are, we are going in. We have a non-Camden person who was a retired teacher who was a facilitator or a coach who has special skills that, is, that are, is there to go into the classroom, sit with the teachers, and work bottom up, build that systemic change, that instru strong instructional strategies that our students need. need. In Camden, we have pockets of innovation. You have the Brim Medical Center for where, where wonderful things are happening. You have the, the Performing Arts High School. 
trophies all over the place. They, they didn't even have shelves to put them on. And no one knows about this. We have some of our schools are reaching out to the, the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning, and they are being trained in the um, PMI math initiative so they can add rigor to their math lessons on their own in the classroom. And then we had the Priority Schools Initiative. And I think we know, as it was mentioned here, that real systemic change in schools has to happen from the bottom up. Next year, we hope to have a network and have a network of five schools to really build some strong, innovative ideas. The, uh, I have to point out the president of Camden, Camden Education Association came here. We are here only because she invited us to come in. And one of our consultants is also here who spends her days in Pine Point Middle School. So it, it's some wonderful things are happening. And the teachers are open. And to have teachers say, you know, I once learned about flexible grouping, but there was no one in the district or in my building that could model for me. Do you mind coming in? When you've got middle school teachers willing to do flexible grouping and open to all kinds of change, good things are happening. What, things. Let, me, let me ask you, um, you know, from somewhat of an outsider's point of view, but knowing the schools, what are one or two things that if you could, if you could dream um, that, that that, that would help, in, and it's unfortunately dreaming away poverty is is probably not one of the uh, uh, one of the the chances you have. But but how schools can improve upon themselves, maybe addressing some of the poverty issues. But I mean, talk about what are the one or two tangible things that that Camden schools could do to improve their lot. Well, I think that I believe that Camden schools have to be part of the community. It's not just a building that's open from eight to three. It's a building that's there for before kids who need to go in from the high school to get homework finished or printed out on the computer, where parents can come after school and do homework in a library, in a computer lab, um, even to the point where someday there could be medical centers in each neighborhood school so that the students that families that belong to that school could have their health care taken care of right there. What technology? Kids need the laptops in their hands, not the principals, to do their evaluations. Uh, and the technology needs to work in their buildings. You know, they have, they have smart boards, but you need an infrastructure where your smart, goods, smart boards work. You need tech people who know how to fix them when they go down. And you need computers and printers that work. I think you listed more than one thing, but that's well, okay. No, that's one big no, that's, thing. That's one large thing. <laughs> it's my that's dream, okay. my one dream. No, that's fair. <laughs> Gloria, Gloria, yes, speak. I, I, yes, I, I really, I love your question because, you know, we, it's the audience's we at Leap it's Academy, we, we've been doing some of this work, and we know that it works when, and I want to say, yes, that leadership begins, uh, you know, you can lead from different levels, but we do need a new sense of leadership that not only values parents, it seems to me that parents are forgotten in this dialogue, and that they're critical. I mean, I, I could not have done the work that I've done here at Camden. I mean, I started with the Parents Academy early on, talking to parents about what was needed. And to this day, I will argue that it's my parents who really keep this place uh, so a comprehensive model that looks at extended day, extended year, looking at when you talk about community, we're talking about really engaging community, uh, building schools that are reflected of the needs of those parents. We value their voice. We value who they are. And not only that, but we also value our teachers. And we say to our teachers, you know, part of the dialogue here about those RAC centers is, is that I think the RAC centers have every good intention. I think they came in maybe a little bit too late. Uh, and so I will hope that the governor and that also the commissioner will keep them because because I do, I do see the work that they're doing in terms of uh, you know, building community with those classrooms. I mean, when you have a district that doesn't have a K-12 literacy curriculum, so you got to begin there. I mean, how bad can it get? It can only get better. And I think for the first time, those RAT centers are now saying, we need to teach teachers how to use data to drive instruction. So they're working with those teachers. You know, we can't say that this is a result of, and continue to blend. I really argue that we need to develop, we need to transform the district. We can't, we got to stop talking about reforming. There's no way you can reform. You have to transform it. It's a new day. I mean, there's just so much out there that we can learn from. Uh, if we just say, you know, let's be open to innovation, let's use the technology. I mean, it's not 23,700 per district. And when I looked at the numbers, it's $30,000 with the outside federal dollars that we're spending on every child. 
And, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm not here just to advocate for charter schools, but I will argue that we get, what, 15000 per child. And we have extended day, extended year. You know, we, we produce results. We don't have all the best test scores, but it's not about just test scores. It's about getting kids to learn, to read, to learn mathematics. It's about getting teachers to get their due when, you know, their pay for performance. It's about promoting community. And so I know we can do it. I know we can do this. This is not rocket science, folks. I mean, people say it's difficult. You bet it is. It's longer hours. It's working hard. It's believing in people that nobody ever cared for. I mean, we get kids that are, don't know how to read and write in fourth and fifth grade, for God's sake. And we got to turn them around. And we got to teach them how to read and write. And whose fault is that? Well, you know, guess what? You know, we're all accountable. At the end of the day, this is a community here. We all got to take responsibility. And we got to say, okay, this is an opportunity to fix it. So I'm saying that it can be done. Uh, it can be done. And, and, you know, I think that when George speaks about leadership, it's critical. Leadership matters. It matters because you've got to set a shared vision. And that vision has to come from parents, teachers, the community. Everyone saying, we want to do this because it's about the kids. You know, we got to stop having Camden being in the national news and an embarrassment to the country. Camden has great news. You're absolutely right when you say you got schools that are great with good principles, but nobody's talking about that. You know, good families that are doing wonderful things that are getting up every day to make sure that their kids get dressed up so they can get to school in in spite of all the challenges. So, you know, we got serious issues here. And, you know, this is why I welcome the opportunity because I think that if someone can do it, is we can do this. It's not rocket science. You know, it's been done in other places. We got the best minds in this table, in this, in this audience. We have great people, great teachers that we can, you know, take the lead. I mean, so this is the time to do it. Another multifaceted one answer. Um, John, can I make one? I, I just want to okay. point out that Gloria State was stand behind her test scores, but when the governor took over the other day, he even made the comment he could not stand guarantee an outcome when he takes over this district. That that concerns me at least, you know. Let me, Catherine Rube, um, you work in Collingswood schools uh, and you've worked in Camden schools as a teacher. Put yourself back in Camden schools. Uh, what, what one or two things, or or several things, um, that you have in Collingswood that you didn't have in 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 Camden, you know, that would that would make for a better education for those kids. I think honestly that it's not about sort of what you have or what you don't have. Um, I think the most important thing, like I said, is training teachers. I think that yes, the RACs are coming in and doing a lot of really important work. My concern with a lot of what they're doing, um, because of sort of how thinly they're spread, a lot of the feedback that they're giving um, is in terms of do this, use this strategy, here's how to do this strategy. And ultimately what I think would make a huge difference is getting our teachers even beyond that to just beyond where they're just proficient and able to effectively use all of these strategies to where they're artists and where, you know, you can walk into a classroom and say, all right, my third period today, I'm going to teach this lesson this way, but my fourth period, that is why a totally is different not, group of kids. Why does that not happen in Kim? Um, a lot of it is the support isn't there. Um, in terms of professional development, it's been mentioned that there's a lot of professional development that is very, you know, you get a few pieces and then I think the follow-up issue was mentioned earlier. Um, that's a really big part of it, consistency. And honestly, giving teachers space to dream and go beyond just compliance, there's a lot of pressure on teachers in the district to be compliant. When you walk into the classroom, these are the things that I need to see on your walls, whether or not you're actually using them effectively, but I have a set of things that I need to address, and to do that, I need to know that you've got these five things on your walls. Um, and I'm going to walk around and make sure they're all there, but are they being used effectively? And that's my big concern. So a lot of it around teacher quality and training, and and are, and and not the case in Collingswood. I mean, is there a, a noticeable difference between? Um, I mean, you see a lot of similar things elsewhere. So yes, I mean, there I do. I have a great group that I work with where I do have that space. Um, I think someone also mentioned earlier about teachers saying, "Please teach me. I want to learn." Um, I think sometimes there's this idea out there that teachers don't want to be told what to do, just kind of want to close their door and teach the way they've been teaching for 20 years. But 
most teachers want to learn and want to get better and when those opportunities are presented are finding themselves saying yes please teach me more and so making those opportunities as available as possible you're in the classroom Karen one thing that would make your you think would make a real difference in your in your school it's kind of hard to say just the uh, one thing that would make it better but uh, I know that when there are many goals that is presented towards teachers okay that's the difficulty you know that teachers are having you know when you, when you have it coming from the top that all right I want you to f uh, help with parents coming in get your parent support I want you to also use this data. I also want you to, uh, to get better with writing your lesson plans. I want you to use you know, the different types of strategies. I want you, we have too many goals that we're trying to accomplish. If we want to do a great job, let's try to focus on one, two a year, and we can do better with just the one, two, instead of having uh, 10, eight different at a time. I believe that's basically what we need to work on. We've gotten a lot of questions, um, and, and I sort of moved it to the end for a reason, um, but, but it's time to talk about some of the issues of school choice and charter schools. Um, this is a district that is moving quickly um, towards uh, you know, a large number. I think I, I heard one, one set of numbers that within a year or two, a third of the district will be in charter schools or non-district schools. Um, and you know, with the, with the advent of Renaissance schools, it could move further and further towards that. Um, let me speak to a, a couple of the folks who are involved in that and, and why they think that will make a difference. Why, uh, and, and you know, we're, we can debate the merits of charter schools and I don't think there's one story of charter schools much like there isn't one story of, of district schools. They, they vary in quality, they vary in, in achievement. Um, let me ask, and I'll, I'll start with George. Why, you know, we've, we've talked about the things that are or are not happening in, in, the, in the Camden public schools. Uh, why are charters gonna be, and why are they, and, and there's some iffy ones now too, why are they a, a better lot for these children? Well, one thing that's been fairly evident is that this district, for years and years, has had a strategy of hope. Hope is not a strategy. Hope, I hope this is going to happen, I hope that's going to happen, and much of it has never happened. Now, if you want to look at what might be a model new school district, take a look at the Renaissance School Program, which the school board recently approved for approximately a quarter of the city. Many months went into the planning, the engagement of the community, of parents, of religious leaders, and of other leaders in the community about what they wanted in a brand new school if they could have it. And that question was just asked. Things like longer school days, longer school years, early intervention programs for testing for kids so that you don't find out in the fourth grade there's a learning difficulty that can't be cured, one that should be cured early. Healthcare services, I heard someone mention that. In our new Renaissance School at Cooper, every student and their family is going to have access to high quality health care services like a student in Cherry Hill or Haddonfield. These are the kind of things that are going to be offered in a new school. Teachers are trained for years before they enter the classroom and that's something he should talk about in detail. This was not something that was put together in a hurry. To their credit, the NJEA was a partner in that legislation, which is pilot legislation. But all in all, the kids in this city and their parents are entitled to immediate access if they choose to quality education. Whether that is a voucher program that will enable them to go to a school that they feel is appropriate for their child immediately, whether it's through a charter school where almost 30% of the student population resides today. The Renaissance School is a public school where there's going to be automatic availability for seats. Automatic availability, just as a public school is. But it's a new test pilot school, which will spend the amount of money that's necessary to educate a child. There won't be excuses of why IT doesn't work, 
why teachers can't get training, why they can't raise their hand and say, I want to learn more, you're starting over. And I think the one is lesson... That, is, is that the key, is the starting over? I mean, could you have, could Cooper have teamed up with a, with a district school and offering similar services? <laughs> no, that, I mean, I'm not... You sure could have. And my first initiative two years ago was for the state to consider what's done in Philadelphia, which is taking failing public schools and turning them over to public-private partnerships in order to recalibrate schools, and that was met with enormous opposition. Met with enormous opposition. And, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what he was. Sorry, keep going. I think alternatives need to be presented. And I think parents today don't want to hear my child is lost in another school year. And they need to be provided with instantaneous access to what they deem is appropriate. If it's a charter school, if it's a LEAP Academy, if it's one of the other charters in the city that are high quality, they ought to be afforded that opportunity instantaneously. Not three years from now, not seven years from now. Because every single year that goes by, another class of kids could very well be gone. And I just want to remind everybody, this wouldn't happen in the suburbs. It would never happen in the suburbs. Never. It wouldn't be tolerated in the suburbs. And it shouldn't be tolerated here. There shouldn't be 3,000 kids on a waiting list to go to an alternative school or to want a voucher to go to another school. It's unacceptable. Talk, uh, Ryan, I want to give you an opportunity. Um, you know, talk a little bit about, folks may not know Kip's model very well. Um, I got to know Ryan in Newark right when he started. I think I met him uh, as he started and, and have followed Kip's progress there. And, and you know, talk about what you hope to bring to Newark, or I'm sorry, to, to Camden, that, and, the lessons of, and, the lessons of Cam, and the lessons of Newark that might apply to Camden. Yeah, I mean, so as George mentioned, this is a, one of the things we like about the Urban Hope Act is that this is a public school. It's part of the public school district. Charter schools are public schools too, but they're not part of the district. And so sometimes people use that to say that charter, or to pit charters against district schools. In this case, we were approved by the school board the district school board and our test scores will be part of the district's success and what we and we are working closely in concert with the with the district and also we as George mentioned admit all of the students within ascending area just like a district school does so we like the part the, the fact that from the outset this is a partnership with the district from the outset this is part of the solution to helping the Camden School District improve. In terms of what we hope to bring to Camden, our schools in Newark, 85% of the students we have with us in eighth grade go on to college, 85%. Um, that's the, and that's at the bottom line, that is what we hope to bring, we hope to even do better than that in Camden. Um, in one of the students being your niece, of course. Um, The, the charter school fan club has come down from Newark, and that's and that's part of what. But that's we have passionate advocates in Newark, and unfortunately, sometimes the dialogue is charter versus district. That's what needs to end, and that's what we can be part of a solution that doesn't say charter versus district. But all the kids in Camden matter. All the kids in just like all the kids in Newark matter, and that's what we can be part of. In Newark, 8,500 students, 8,500 kids, are on our wait list. We serve 2,000, but we've got 8,500 on our wait list. So we want to be a big part of what happens here in Camden, and we hope that uh, and we, we don't just see the students in our schools as our students, we see all the students as our students. Monique, speak to as a parent. Aren't choices good? Uh, you know, isn't it having the opportunity to have extended day? I mean, this is a... Well, that's an interesting word when you say choice. Um, I am a parent of Landing Square, and I'm mandated to have a school that I didn't choose for my in my area. So when you say choice, you still have an option to pick and choose which school you want your child to go to. And um, I not only have my current son who was there who has his school dismantled last year, but I have 
three older young, I mean, three adult students who went through that same school. So it's kind of a little touchy with me on that. And um, as far as Renaissance being, yes, it is a public school because they get public funding, but it's not a district part of the district school. So district, that is 95% funding. That's why it's called. It's not a traditional public school. And um, I have to say again, I don't like being selfish when you say you have certain children and children waiting in lines and um, on waiting lists and stuff. I want all of the children to get better to quality education because they all deserve it. Every last one of our children, regardless what the name is on the school. Every, Canada's only what, 9.35 miles? We have, what, 17 charters already with five getting ready to come in. And then what's gonna happen to the traditional public schools where our ESL learners and our special needs are gonna be left back? What's gonna happen to them? And there's no funding. We can not admit, we get cut funding for the last, what, almost going on eight years. You know, the last four years we lost 28, 28 million. And then, and I, you know, it's kinda touchy for me and don't, you know, don't take it the wrong way. I'm not. I'm speaking angry because it's personal. And my thing is, you know, the governor says, oh, the public schools don't need no more money. But yes, let's put in some more charters or some renaissance and give them 90 and 95%. That's a contradictory. It's a contradictory. And that school school spending that they put for our children, that they say 23 to 30,000, honey, it's a different story when you allocate the special needs because we're paying about 60 to 40 to 60,000 each on those children. Do you, Ryan, do you want to? speak to it and I certainly want to ask Gloria about it but I mean Absolutely. your opportunity I mean what big issue with charters and I've I got five or six um, <laughs> that comes up with charters is that, are they reflective of the larger community um, and you know I and I speak to it how that's played out in Newark I know it's a big issue in Newark uh, speak to it you know and she raises it as well does it serve the same number of special needs children does it say, serve the same number of limited English Here's your opportunity. Right. So, so first of all, what's what's happened in Landing Square over the last ten years? You've been promised buildings, uh, you've been promised schools, and they haven't they haven't come to fruition. They haven't happened. And so, and so that's so that is absolutely part of the history here. We we get that, and what we're trying to do is help to be part of the solution to that problem. Um, so the the. As for the charter sector, I can't speak for all charter schools. Saying charter schools, just like saying state takeover, sometimes it, it totally depends on how it's executed. I can tell you our numbers. This, the city of Newark, the superintendent of Newark, came out with a study on charter schools this year and, and said, what are your free and reduced lunch population? What are your poverty rates? What are your uh, rates of students with special needs? And uh, basically, how at risk is your population? And, what they, and when they looked at that, they said that our charter schools, the team schools in Newark, our 2,000 kids, are lower income and just as likely to have special needs as the rest of the district. So that's, that's, that's the reality of who we serve in Newark. And that's going to be the reality of who we serve in Camden. So in Camden, it's as we're, we're serving ascending zone, just like a district school would, and parents have the, op the option to attend if they live in Landing Square, right? But they don't, they're not forced to attend. So if you have a child who's in the grades we serve at the time when we open, then your, your child has automatic enrollment but can opt out. So it's still a school of choice. And I, on this, op on this uh, topic of school choice, if you think about it, every rich person in America has school choice, right? They can choose a private school, they can move to a different district. Every middle class person in America has school choice because they can move to a district based on the school. And that's, and that's why people move to different towns most of the time, looking for, looking for schools that are good for their kids. The only people in America who have to go to the school that a bureaucrat tells them to go to are poor people. That's the only people in America. Take advantage of us because they can't speak for nobody. Go ahead, uh, Whatever the reasons are. That's the that's 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 our school system in here. Like you, you're not part of our, our so, system here. So, so what we want to offer is, a, is an option great. for folks. Not a forced option, but an option that people can take advantage of if they, if they choose to. That's a, that is school choice. And that's what, we, that's what we offer, just like, and what we hope to do is offer that to the folks of Camden, just like we offer it to the folks. In Newark. Yeah. Just so you get some clear, it wasn't that 
my that was I was mandated for my children to go that I had history in that neighborhood okay. and I wanted my child to go to Landon Square. Okay. So gotcha. and the reason why I say we're being mandated for that school because we have no other public school in that area. Okay. That's right. That's right. Gloria, Gloria, speak to it and but and speak to the issue. You know Camden well, but um, and I'm not sure Leap has always uh, made AYP itself. Um, we, we haven't. We haven't. In yeah. So speak, no, no, I mean, is this I, a better life? Be, I, I want to be honest. I mean, not. Um, not no, it should not be. I mean, actually, we have a hundred percent. Let me finish, and then you can you can you can challenge me. But uh, we do have a hundred percent college placement, and you know the state just came out with the data. Eighty-five percent of those kids have stayed in college, and some of them are just being admitted to graduate school, law school. So our kids are doing well. It's not about uh, just uh, all the time about test scores. I will argue that our kids in the elementary have not uh, met a white bee at all times, and I will tell you why. I will tell you why, because these are the same kids that everybody else has in Camden School. It takes us until seventh grade or eighth grade to get those kids sometimes to do well in literacy and mathematics. It takes an incredible amount of work. Listen, my teachers work really hard, and so, so in my administration works really hard. We're not perfect. I'm not saying here that charters is the way to go. However, you know, whatever you want to call it. We, we got to look for whatever option is possible to fix our school system. Whether it's portfolio schools, whether it's renaissance, whatever you want to call it. Call it whatever you want. But at the end of the day, we got to do something. Because you know what? Failure is not an option. Not for my parents, at least, and not for our kids. And so, you know what? What we're saying here is we need to fix it. It's not working. And yes. You know, we're, like I said, Leap Academy is not perfect. We we are working very hard. We have five buildings in Cooper Street. We will continue to grow. We want to partner with the district. We want to take out what has worked and work with the district and the teachers and the principal, whoever wants to, and the union. You know, we have at one point, listen, you know, at one point we have to come together to the table and we have to decide how do we tackle the challenge. We can continue to lose children every year. And listen, when we talk about special ed, you want to know something about special ed and ESL? My first group of kids that came in into Leap Academy, my first group, at least 400 of those kids, out of 400 of those, at least 100 of those kids were classified special needs. And you know why? Because they could not speak English. Because somebody decided to call them special ed. When we looked at these kids, we had to unclassify them. We had to teach them. And I will argue, listen, all those kids graduated and they went to college. But it takes an incredible amount of work. This is not easy. Those of you who are in the classrooms know exactly what I'm talking about. It takes a lot of effort to care about those kids and a lot of time. This is not a quick fix here. But it's not rocket science. All you need is a curriculum, or you need people, adults that care to go in that classroom and spend the hours that are needed. And so that's that's what it takes. One of the one of the issues that's come up with Listen, charter, my, charter schools are public schools. All the yeah, kids. All right. Laura. We don't send anybody back. If they go back by themselves, well, I don't. Let me you know. let me ask, and, and Gloria, I I warned you on this. Excuse me. Uh, I warned I warned Gloria on this question and somebody asked as well. One of the issues that arises with, with charter schools is, albeit they are public schools, um, they are privately run. There's at least a perception that there's some less transparency. I warned Gloria, I'd asked this question. You gotten a little bit of uh, newspaper coverage for um, the hiring of a, a chef who you were familiar with and for $95,000 a year. Answer it. I don't believe you've answered, spoken to this issue I yet. I haven't so. spoken to this issue because, as as you all know, I said to the press that I have, I have abstained myself from voting on those issues. I was very transparent with the board on this, and so as as you know, what I can talk to you about tonight is about the fact that we have yes a chef that is on board who cares about our kids, who actually gets paid to cook. And to give my kids three meals a day, we have a nutritional program. We care deeply about our kids. We think that feeding kids is, is important. And we also believe that they are critical. Uh, whatever nutritional program that we have right now is working for us. And that's really what matters to me at this point. So that, that's, you know, I have been very transparent about abstaining myself from any voting that involved the chefs, just like, and I have also disclosed with the Commission on Ethics on this matter. So it's, there's no, no secret here. I, I want to be as open as possible with you about that. Uh, and so that's, that's it. Let me, let me speak to, in general, um, on transparency issues. And, and the Renaissance schools, you know, are going to be 
admittedly they are public schools, but they'll be privately run. Um, you know, they will not have the same public bidding laws uh, that, that are required uh, under, I think, even charter schools. Um, let me ask George, your sense of, is private, is the private sector, can they, are they, can they do this better in your view than, than the public sector? Is that, I mean, this, this law is, is, you know, some people have described these as Uber charter schools because they'll have more money, they'll have some more flexibility. Speak to the, to, to the private issue that arises so much around school reform issues. This law is designed in order to construct or substantially renovate schools in a particular catchment area, which are gonna be state of the art. What you'd expect in any suburban community, which Camden deserves. One thing that doesn't exist in this city is state of the art athletic facilities for the kids of this city. They don't exist. One of the things we're doing as part of this school with our own funding is to raise the money to construct high quality community athletic facilities for kids kind of thing I enjoyed when I grew up. Grew up. I played Little League, midget football. I'm not sure you can find that anywhere in this city. You need before school programs, you need after school programs. It requires an initiative, it requires fundraising, and it requires the ability to get things done. I remember somebody mentioning regulation in the classroom, guidelines that restrict the ability of teachers to I'm not a big believer in regulation, guidelines, when it comes to public utilities like education, where the human capital that's engaged is far more important. And you don't find that in a textbook, you don't find it in a guidebook that's going to tell you how to teach a student, because every student is different. I think one of the things that people ought to think about, unlike anywhere else in this state, is you have various groups and organizations that have never come together before to reason together and to work together. When have you seen Republican administration, Democrat administration, NJEA, religious leaders, community leaders, and otherwise say it's time to come together and sit together in forums like this, school board members, some of whom have strong opinions on various issues that are all well-meaning and well-intended, can sit down and talk about how do we make this better. I don't think anywhere in this state this has occurred. Certainly not in Newark, certainly not in Jersey City, and certainly not in Patterson. And I think people ought to look forward to how do we sit around and deal with the issues that are important to make a kid's life better tomorrow. Not five years from now, not 10 years from now, because it's too late, it's over. Our school is gonna open in 2014 and we're going to make sure it happens in 2014 because otherwise the class that begins in 2014 if not ready will be lost and think about and visualize all these young kids that might be lost and might be gone I don't think that's something the people of this room want to see happen and it takes bold leadership it takes gutsy leadership and it takes innovation and what's been going on for far too long no matter how well-meaning hasn't worked. It's that simple, hasn't worked. It's time to try different things. It's try time to try pilot programs. It's tr time to try anything that might be an alternative that, that is what has existed to date, which has failed. If it doesn't work, then you don't repeat it. That's why pilot programs that have a beginning and have an end, like Renaissance Schools, Urban Hope, voucher programs, as long as there's an end, if it doesn't work, that's a good thing. But if you don't try, you're not going to succeed. What is the role, Sean, uh, what, is, what is the role of charter schools uh, in, in your eyes for this district? And, and I, I, you know, we're, we're sort of running a little bit low on time. And one of the questions I'm going to ask all of you is, is what is this district going to look like in five or ten years? Uh, is it going to be, a, you know, a, the, the governor talked about New Orleans. Um, which is obviously a predominantly charter school. But what do you think is the role of charter schools in this district? I think that if you have the position that it is very important for a town to have a traditional public school system that runs well, and that's your only position, that it's too rigid. 
if your position is the most important thing is that as a parent, that that parent has an option for the child to go to the best place possible that that parent can afford, which might be free, maybe no cost, might be a public school, um, then that, that parent should have the option. And let me talk about myself as a parent for a second. So I, I, have, a, I have a son. Now, my son's in, in uh, daycare, although I think I pay a little bit too much to call it daycare, but daycare. <laughs> it's not daycare. And, and, and it's early his, his, my son's, my son's tuition went up. So we started looking around at other places. Um, all, all in Camden, because uh, all the places in Collinswood, because I live in Fairview near Collinswood, all the places in Collinswood, there were no vacancies. So, so uh, Keisha and I, we looked at, um, I had to say about 10 places. We got a list from the county, mm -hmm. and we, we took a tour of these places. We went to places where the floors were dirty. We went to one place where the kids were all in front of uh, Dora just watching TV. We went to places where they, I know that the ratio between teachers and students wasn't right. So we, I, had to, I had to suck up the, 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 uh, the, the tuition that, that, that went up and my child continued to go there. Now why do I say that? Because I had, I had a choice, because it's, it's daycare, and a lot of daycares. I had a choice of where to send my child. And I made the choice that I'd rather spend, um, if I may, I'd rather, I'd rather spend $1,000 a month to send my child where my child goes in Camden than pay $700 a month that is, is of, 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 lesser, of lesser quality. I live in Fairview. That means I could, when, when my son, when Ethan is, is six, he can go down the street to Yorkship, a, a traditional public school, or he can go to Freedom Academy, or maybe he can go to, maybe he can go to Leap, right? And I'm able to look at, I'm, I'm an educated guy, so I can go up to the New Jersey School Report Card and I can see the quality of all three of those schools and I can make a decision as a parent. I think the fact that I have those options as a parent in Camden, the education of Ethan is more important than the politics of unions, of legislatures, of all that. That stuff matters in certain contexts, but the education of my son is what matters, is what matters more. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, I'm on the, the whole point of me being on the school board is because we want to put, uh, the goal should ultimately should be to put all those other places out of business, to do so good as a traditional public school system that there's no need for charter schools anymore, and people have so much confidence in the traditional public school system that all those buildings end up being converted to traditional public schools. That should be the really, and when you talk about the goal for, for yeah. 10 years from now, ultimately that's the goal, so you do have a single system where you have a community that, that, that and one of the biggest things that's missing from our community, and this is where leadership ma matters, and we talk about leadership, is that we've never had a, we've never had a mayor or government leaders that have the pulpit that have talked about the importance of learning in an urban poor community. Imagine, look at where we come from. And I see a lot of blacks and Hispanics here. Look at, where, look at our ancestors and where we come from. Where, where my, my, my great great grandparents begged to be able to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. They were prevented from doing so. And look what we've allowed to happen. We've allowed to, it to happen that we don't value education in our urban communities as much as we should, but also those of us that even have it don't speak out about the importance and value of education in, in real simple terms. Get all A's and B's. Go to school every day. Don't let the television, you know, don't watch rated R movies. It's real simple stuff that's not too complicated. So, so when we talk about the future, the future of public education around here, it has to include a single message that, message that learning matters. We have to stop getting distracted by whether it's charter or public, whether George Norcross was involved in it or not, and get to the whole point of, are our kids learning, and if they're not teaching them, then you need to get the hell out of here no matter who you work for. Right. That, until we get to that point and stop being distracted, these conversations will be real interesting, but I can tell you what parents are saying. The parents are saying, I just want my kid to learn. I just want my kid to be ready to go to college and succeed. And I don't just want my kid to go to college, I want him to graduate from college. That's the point that we need to get to. And I think that there's a little bit, sometimes there's, there's a lot of fluff in these conversations because it's a politically convenient thing to do in the moment when ideally, it's just like I said, just like I'm able to say for my son, I just want him to be able to go to a place to learn at the cheapest rate possible, hopefully for free. Next year. As a former board member, um, the role of, of charter schools and renaissance schools, and, and leading into the question, I mean, it, you know, is Camden going to be New Orleans? Um, is it going to move towards a, you know, a, a public-private uh, district where actually traditional schools might be in the minority? I think what matters is that every child in Camden can walk into any school in the city of Camden and get a fantastic education. Not just a good education, not just an education where they pass the HESPA with a 201 and the passing scores of 200, with a fantastic education. And so to me what that means is 
yet the public schools need to be pushed. The public schools need to get a lot better. That also means charter sh schools should be held to just as high, if not higher, of a standard. Mm -hmm. When you have, when you look at charter schools and half their kids aren't, more than half, in some cases three quarters of their kids aren't passing state tests, um, that's an issue. And those schools, in my opinion, should be under a lot more scrutiny. At the same time, when you have charter schools who are doing really good work and whose kids are really learning and who you're seeing it, do test scores tell you everything? No. Do test scores in the aggregate tell you something? Yes. Where you see good test scores, where you see um, a lot of the kids going to college, staying in college. Yeah, that has a place. Um, but what's important is that I think every single operating school building in this city should be fantastic. And until we're there, the work's not done. What about Karen? Speak to, you, you, you see you know, charters from a district um, point of view. I'm, just, I'm a firm believer in public education. I was brought up in the public school system. My parents were in the public school system. And my children, I have three daughters, uh, all are in public school and have graduated from public school. Uh, I'm just looking at what is looking at the difference between the charter schools and the public schools. I see really, you know, where it's basically the same as far as they still, you, the public schools, you have all that is necessary and needed. Yes, they need to get a little bit better. I believe that, you know, but at the same time, you have the charter schools, and when, when they cannot deal with the discipline, they send them back to the public schools, you know. Uh, they're not meeting AYP. They don't have the best leaders. You know, those same issues that they're talking about the public schools, you know, that is happening with the charter schools. So I'm, 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 I'm just a firm believer in public education. And I think I will still continue to feel that we will get better, we need to, and we will continue to push for the best for our children in uh, any urban area. Monique, where do you think the, the district's going to be in five or ten years? Um, I don't want to predict where the district's going to be, but if they keep promoting, you know, charters and choices, I can see that our private schools may fall under. Maybe, you know, be, not, be left for private schools, actually. Um, that's how I see it. And um, just like, you know, Miss Karen spoke and Ms. Revise spoke, I mean, it is about educating our kids. I love public school. I'm pro public. I was um, educated here in Camden. I have older students, I mean, older kids who was educated. And the whole thing about um, where people say is hopeful, to know our kids, and I, I, I go to, I went to Will Joe Wilson when governor was here, and I speak to these kids like regular. We have highly intelligent kids, and their creative is remarkable. And in, for me to hear like, these headlines and all the negative stuff that goes about these kids, when I know that they can achieve higher and the kids who are achieving are getting ignored, I think I, public school is just definitely where I am and that's where my heart is. And I would do anything and be willing to sit with anybody to help our kids in our school. You're gonna, we're almost done. I know these are not sitting here for decorations. If you want to speak, I'll, I'll let you speak. Okay. But, but one ground rule, a question. Can you make a question? Well, will it be a short comment? Okay. So we don't have a lot of time, only because we have to leave. We can do that. If governor came down here as a takeover, that was a plan. All this whole scenario was a plan. What I resent, I predicted he was going to do it after he won. Uh, I think that everything is in place. The Renaissance Schools is out of the way. The appointed board took care of that. He will not be blamed for that. I resent the fact that he comes here and come to Woodrow Wilson and say that my children are losers. Yes. I don't like that. What is this here bully all about? Coming down here in my community and saying that our children are failing. He knew for three years he said that. The board has been down here for over three years. So what is this scenario? I think some of your board members raised that. What is this all about? It's about the money. $56 million come out for just for charter schools. Just for charter schools just this year. You know? Now, I'm concerned about this. 
Is this going to be another Chester? They opened up so many charter schools they could not pay for the public schools. What's going to happen to my children of learning disabilities? What's going to happen to our children that have problems? For the last five years, John, there are children that came out of the schools were not properly uh, prepared. There nobody offered up any jobs, any training. They are a problem to our community. And 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 and, and uh, George said it will not be allowed in the suburbs. The suburbs have been teaching our children, yeah. huh? And ain't nobody owing no money to none of those teachers. Now, he made a statement too. We can't dwell in the past. Yes, we do. It's, a, it's something called George the Sankofa bird. The sand cobra bird is a bird that's walking this way and his head is turned back. In order to go forward, you must understand where you come from. We must pull the weed out of all those bad teachers. Now, what is it? I'm going to wrap this up. Okay. What, is, what is the impact of all these schools that you're opening up to the and, the, and, and uh, the governor said he's going to appoint a advisory board, which another advisory board on top of a advisory board that's been there. What is the impact of people who work in Camden who let, work for the let district? Me, let me, uh, let me, See, let and, me try and, to paraphrase some of this because we... Yeah. Let me. Yeah, I can't let you get away. Because uh, you act like you know, you know, you, know, what's the name? You know where to find. The voices here, and they're serious, and you're glossing all over that. You understand what let I'm me, saying? I mean, George, you, you know, obviously, this, uh, some of those questions were directed at you. But, I mean, where, you know, the, some folks have wondered what your vision is for this district. Is, is it going to be? Y'all built a, 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 a Rutgers University new school, we, uh, a Rowan. Uh, the Cooper Center, please, please. and, and not one percent of the jobs are tied into the local economy. The, the families are failing because the fathers cannot provide for the children. You must Thank tie you. in downtown development to the local economy, to job training. Barack Obama put money in here for weatherization and green jobs. And what did they? Do? What did the power brokers do? Can, put it down and glass. Thank in you. Glass thank you. George, right. speak to, I mean, there's obviously some tensions around where this is headed. It's a legitimate you got it. tension. And, I, and they it's, need to be We're good. Um, speak to this. I mean, I, it, uh, he, he's, he said it. Um, but these are tensions, and these are tensions that have arisen in Newark. These are tensions that have arisen in Patterson. You know, speak to the larger, you know, where do you see this district headed? It, it, will it be predominantly, you know, private charter renaissance schools? Uh, privately run, and, and they are public schools, and I, I think that's important, but, you know, obviously there's, there's let, some let issues. Me, let me try. I can respond to a few things. There are a few things. Hundreds and hundreds of people that live in this city work for Cooper University Hospital. We have a mandated program during our construction as a priority to employ Camden residents first, and we've tried to do our share to provide an opportunity. Over half the people that live in this city receive their health care directly or indirectly from Cooper. Over half the people that live in the city. Now, charters have evolved in all cities across this state and maybe across this country. They've evolved because parents are dissatisfied with the public schools. Now, I believe in the public schools. I'm a product of a public school. I went to Pennsauken High School. Obviously, having a prosperous public school system that serves parents and students is an ideal circumstance. That's why I advocated for the Urban Hope Act and a Renaissance Schools, because unlike charter schools, it accepts every single child, no matter what, in the catchment area, no matter what. That's the neighborhood. And the first school that's been approved by the Board of Education is going to offer opportunity when it's fully completed, K to 12, to every student. Now tell me in this room, who doesn't favor full health care for every child and every family in that school? Tell me who doesn't favor that. Listen, I remember when I had my first drink to a long time ago. Please let us speak. Who in this room doesn't favor early intervention testing for their kids? Who doesn't favor longer school days, longer school years? Who doesn't favor extensive organizational training for teachers, which are the prime investment of any school? 
aside from a parent. That's what Renaissance schools are doing. And there's not a child within the catchment area that will be denied access. That to me is the failing of charters, where there's not mandatory acceptance, where we have two or 3,000 kids sitting on a wait list whose mom and her dad saying, I need to go to this school. That's how I got involved in education in Camden. A woman came up to me at a Cooper event and said, I need your help. I said, for what? She said, I need you to get my two kids into a charter school. Now, I thought that would be easy until I found out there's a waiting list and a lottery system. And thank God there are parents that want to have their child get a wonderful education. And if they choose Leap Academy or the public schools or want a voucher to go to a different school district, we should provide that opportunity today, now, because we can't keep debating, discussing. Yes, you have to look backward. Yes, you have to look and say, what's wrong? What can we do to drive what goes on? But you also have to act. And the problem that's been going on here for so many years is a lack of inaction. I started off my remarks earlier. The last superintendent of schools here was AWOL for almost a year. Nobody knew where she was. Nobody could find her. And we ran her out of here. <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah, no, the state you of New Jersey ran her out of here. <laughs> Folks, we're, we're going to be closing no, soon. No, so. you didn't. <laughs> we're running out of time. <laughs> let, him, let him finish. Let him finish. <laughs> Very briefly, very, please, because we're going to be kicked out, literally. I'm going to make this very brief and very succinct. Now, I'm a product of the Camden School of, of Camden High Street. I, I, I was the first and only black American from Camden to be awarded an officer's commission in the Marine Corps. And I spent years manning the wall to defend this country against despotic leaders, countries that were we, under the rule of one government. Let me finish, no, uh, please. Now, serious. I come back to Camden. Camden's under the rule of one party. There you go. Uh, one Mr. Norcross says that uh, he, for the past five years, he, you know, he's felt that the Camden students were being shortchanged. Uh, and you know, you've been in power for over 20 years, Mr. Norcross. So suddenly you are concerned about this, the, the children in Camden. Cooper Hospital got a large portion of the $175 million intended for economic development and public safety in the city of Camden. Where was your concern then? And also, Mr. Norcross, also, Mr. Norcross, the school board, as it is constructed and appointed under Dana Red, is under your indirect control. And also, Let him. also, this one party in 2003, this one party stripped the elected leaders of their authority, the mayor and city council. In 2009, that same party stripped the residents of their right to elect a school board, and that is a constitutional right. And now, that one party, oh, oh, by the way, that party wrote the Hope Act. Yes. You know who they are. Your brother. Okay? Donald. Proud. And, and the bottom line is, the charter school movement is not about educating poor, black, Hispanic children. It's about redistributing wealth. It's about turning over the responsibility of educating our children to corporate America and Wall Street. Okay, thank you. George, do you want to address? If I wanted to go to a political meeting, I'd go to a different forum. Let him. Listen, this gentleman has run for office. He probably is running right now. So it's a wonderful political speech. Listen, you have every right in the world to say whatever's on your mind. Okay, I'm not here to defend charters. I'm here to talk about what Cooper and the Cooper Foundation is sponsoring and what opportunity it is for the students that are involved in the Renaissance School program. I don't hear you dismissing or opposing the idea of health care or early intervention programs or longer school days or longer school years. I hear you getting up railing against what you're... I I, listen, 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 listen to me. Listen, my friend, you've run for office, you've been roundly defeated. Listen, I'm happy, listen. Listen, listen, the Board of Education is highly independent. There are two members sitting up here, one former member. That Board of Ed is the most independent Board of Ed
that's probably existed in years and years. Martha Wilson sits on that board. Ray Lamboy, who I saw here earlier, sits on that board. Barbara Coscarello sits on that board and others, all of whom have taken the time out of their lives to be part of what goes on and passionately have different views and opinions which we should respect. Railing against everything doesn't solve any problems. Solutions and action matters. And at least some of these people on the Board of Ed have seen the time to get up and say, here's what I think. The NJA, to their credit, and the teachers that are here today and others, to their credit, are saying, I want to be part of a solution. I want to be part of a solution. I'm raising my hand. That's my point. We need to move forward, evaluate the past, but move forward. And there are ample ways to do that, which are certainly going to be better than what exists today. All right. We are running out of time. Uh, we, we were told we'd be out of here at 7 o'clock, and it is after that. I want to thank, and I hope you all will thank the panel for, for joining us today. It's not an easy discussion. Let them. There were, there were. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? Why don't we agree to continue the discussion? I agree, and let me. Can I finish? Let me finish this thought. One one gaping uh, hole in this discussion is the role of the state, and uh, we talked about it from afar. None of us are are the ones representing them. I am hoping that we will be back here, sitting with Chris Surf or somebody who represents the Christie administration, to talk about their plans for the state. I also want to make. And I think every one of these folks will, is willing to hang around if you do want to speak with them. This is an opportunity to do so. I know this is not the end of this discussion. And I'm hoping that we got some issues out on the table. And I think I appreciate the audience very much. There were a lot of questions we didn't get to. But I hope I wove up most of them in there. But thank you very much. I appreciate it. Read NJ Spotlight and, and stay in touch on these issues. It's critically important. Thank you very much. For more information on NJ Spotlight programs, visit the website njspotlight.com. We produce this program in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at NJ Spotlight, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and take good care. NJ Spotlight, where issues matter.